Hi guys, my name is Piers Ridiard. I'm the CEO of Radix, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about Uniswap and as a broader idea, what a continuous function market maker is. Like, why are people so excited about Uniswap and what is this really esoterically named concept, continuous function market maker? Now, before... Uniswap existed, um, lots of people had tried to build decentralized uh, exchanges. Um, and it's a really difficult thing to do because of what a, what an exchange actually has to do. If you think about uh, how an exchange operates in, in a centralized process, what you have is a really fast server that has got an order book. And there's all of these orders that are coming in to buy and sell at different prices. And the order book has to order them both in terms of priority, uh, which ones came in first, which ones came in second, and in terms of where they sit. So, like, is this a is this a limit order or a or a, a sell or a, or a, a you know a spot market order? And like, which of these orders on the order book should be taken first, and which of these ones should be taken second? And all of that stuff is when you really boil down to it often done on a on a on a on a single or a group of very powerful computers that are very well interconnected. And the reason that you want to do that is you want to stop things like front running. You want to stop people coming in and going, oh, I just saw that John has put in this order and I'm going to put in the same order ahead of him to buy it off the market and then sell it back to him at a bit more expensive price. That's what Flash Boys, if anyone has read the book or, or, or knows what I'm talking about, is all about. And this is what high frequency trading is essentially all about is a is a fancy term, often, not always, but often for front-running other people's orders. Now, the way that a, uh, a decentralized order book has to run is that everyone on the ledger kind of has to agree that the, this is the next order that's going to happen. And it has to have some way of tracking what liquidity is being provided by whom at what price. So often on an exchange... If you're an everyday user of an exchange, you don't really think about this, but you'll come to the exchange and you'll look at Binance and it will say, right, the price for Ethereum is $400 uh, an ETH. How is that price set? How is that arrived at? And what's happening in the background is someone has to be offering that or close to that um, uh, for to, to, to sell you uh, one Ethereum, one ETH uh, for $400. Which means that someone has to be providing the liquidity on the other side. And you might like to think that, well, it's just someone else who's come in and said that they're going to sell an Ethereum for $400. And you just so happen to be on Binance at exactly the right moment for that to happen. Now, that is true some of the time. But what happens if you wanted $1,200 of Ethereum and there wasn't exactly that many people selling it on the other side? You then start what's called buying up the order book. You start moving the price and the amount of the, the amount the price moves when you're trying to buy is called slippage. So let's say I'm buying $1,200 worth of Ethereum and it started that I got the first ETH for $400, but then the next ETH was $404 and then the next ETH was $408. And so, you know, and then the, and then the, and then I've got my $1,200, $1,206 um, of, of, uh, of Ethereum. So why, why did the price go up? Well, the price went up is because essentially there is professionals who sit on these books who are arbitra are doing arbitrage, trading arbitrage all of the time, where they're like, right, I'm going to put some some orders on the order book just above, um, or actually just below the spot price, and I'm going to put some some sells on the order book just above, so that if the price starts moving away from spot. I will start selling at a premium to what the what the spot price on, on the on the order book is. Now this is a massively simplified it, it description of actually a very complicated process because sometimes the price moves not because it's moved on that exchange, but because it's moved on a, another exchange somewhere else. Uh, and there's all of this aggregate movement happening. You can think of every single exchange's price 
as not just being the price that exists on that exchange, but the price that exists on that exchange versus all of the other exchanges. And that the price for a highly traded asset like Ethereum or Bitcoin is actually the aggregate of the weighted value of all trades happening and all order books what all order books look across all of the exchanges around the world that I can move if that I can that I can create arbitrage opportunities between which starts to be a sort of a, a bit of a mind bending concept to 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 put your head around combined with that with the fact that and you, when you put your assets, if you're a professional market maker and you are providing liquidity to the market, you're actually putting these assets um, on onto uh, onto the order book. But you have to keep moving it because if the price moves, um, and you actually just want to always be about about five percent above spot and five percent below spot, then. To make sure that your as spot moves around, but you're not getting high volume purchases, that means it starts purchasing up the order book. You don't necessarily want to be, you know, trading dimes and nickels. You want to be trading serious. You want to be doing serious volume. If that, so, if there's a big buy order and it comes up the book, great, you make a profit. But if the the small buys and sells, that can all just happen at spot. So you've got to constantly be moving by creating algorithms that you've you know written on written on servers that are constantly pinging the APIs of the of the exchange, and constantly be moving your 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 um, inventory of assets. Uh, that are available to trade up and up and down between that spot instance. And this is this is complicated. Um, and there are some people who are very good at good at it. And for very large traded assets, it doesn't sort of matter. Like for you know Apple and Google and Tesla, that's always happening all of the time. And the same for Bitcoin and Ethereum and Ripple and things like that. But when you start getting to the smaller places what you end up is you get th these very strange looking order books so order books normally what you like to see is this nice v shape from where where spot price is and then you can see all of the sort of limit orders that are up and down the order book that sort of sit and then move as the as the market moves and, and sort of trades in in spot that is a nice order book um but for but for for smaller traded assets that simply just sometimes doesn't exist and sometimes you get a really lumpy one where there's lots of people who will sell and no one will buy and so you can sell all the way down the order book but you can't buy it but you can't uh buy up the order book for example anyway the continuous function market maker is this wonderfully simple function that means I don't have to worry about creating a really complicated order book, which really doesn't work in a decentralized system because sharing an order book is a great way of ma making it very easy to do things like front running and also running order book calculations and making that up real time enough for people on top of a public decentralized ledger also really doesn't work. So what some people decided was, hey, maybe we could do it in a different way. Maybe we could rethink this concept of an exchange and market makers. And instead of having this order book mechanism where I have to move my inventory up and down the order book as the price moves, instead, we'll have this continuous function. And the way the continuous function works is brutally simple and crucially can all happen within a single block. So within a single transaction, within a single opera, uh, the, the time that it takes to do one um, confirmation on top of Ethereum, you can end up ordering all of these orders that come in in a very deterministic way. And you can work out what price should be given because the people who are providing the liquidity have done so by just giving it to this function, this mathematical function. And the mathematical function just says, right, if I've sold one, if I have 10 units of this and 10 units of this, let's say I've got 10 units of asset A and 10 units of asset B, my price for this is currently you can give me one unit of asset A and I'll give you one unit of asset B back, right? That's my exchange price because the ratio of these two assets is one to one. However, now I have 11 units of asset A and nine units of asset B which means that the ratio has moved, 
Now asset B is more expensive per unit than asset A because what you're trying to do, what the continuous function market maker is doing is trying to keep the aggregate value, the ratio to represent the price of those two assets. So now I have to put 1.1 units of asset A in to get one unit of asset B. And if I do that, now I've moved it again. It's now 12.1 versus eight. And suddenly asset B is even more expensive. Now, what I've done is a simplification of that. It actually moves much more quickly. So as you come to there being the one unit of asset B, there you get to the point where you have hundreds of units of asset A because as the less as there's less asset B and more asset A, asset B becomes exponentially more expensive. So you can never run out of asset B. If if people are just putting in asset A to get asset B, asset B just gets more and more expensive until it, it tends towards infinitely expensive and it tends towards infinite money on the other side. Now that obviously never happens because what the continuous function market maker is relying on is this idea of, well, if it actually asset B is worth one of asset A, not 1.1 of asset A, the logical thing for me to do is to come along and put one of asset B in and then take the 1.1 of asset A out so that I can then restore the balance of the ratio between the two. Now this is a is a is a very simple concept that has revolutionized the way that exchanging is done on top of decentralized fi or in decentralized finance. Not only because there is no order book and none of this complicated moving of liquidity around a, a spot price, and none of this requirement to be a professional market maker. All you need to do is have some of asset A and some of asset B, and suddenly you can be a liquidity provider to these pools which has meant that continuous function market makers have now ended up exceeding the volumes that are seen on things like Coindesk, which when you think about Coindesk as being something that's been around for uh, getting on for eight, nine years and continuous function market makers like Uniswap having been around for around a year or less, that is kind of mind-blowing. And it's because of all of these really special features that mean that suddenly the community, the passive community can be a liquidity provider to these instruments and the exchanging can be done in a way that is brutally simple. Not necessarily perfect. There's lots of things that are wrong with it that people don't like, like impermanent loss. But but despite these like complicated concepts like impermanent loss, the brutal simplicity of it has created a scenario where you end up having an incredibly powerful tool for exchanging one asset for another in a decentralized fashion that can happen really quickly and that a community of people can provide liquidity to. And that, in a nutshell, is what a continuous function market maker is and why it is exciting. And last of all, Obviously, the reason that we call Radix the decentralized finance protocol is because one of the ways in which we really focus on DeFi is making building these kind of things incredibly easy. On things like Ethereum, what you have to do is you have to build your own smart contract logic from scratch in Solidity and then execute it as a full smart contract on top of the ledger. However, DeFi is amazing at borrowing concepts from each other, like the continuous function market maker that that, that was come up with um, for the Uniswap also became the continuous function market maker in Uniswap, uh, in, in SushiSwap, it became the continuous function market maker in things like uh, uh, strike, which is currently now called perpetual, that people are now putting into things like bonding curves and working out how to do futures. Like all of these building blocks build on top of each other. And on Radix, these building blocks are called components. They are uh, self-contained, secure 
um, uh, primitives, which you can call directly from the Radix ledger. Instead of having to go, right, I'm going to go and cut my own Solidity code to build my own continuous function market maker, the Radix ledger has an expandable component set that you can draw from so you can go right i need a continuous function market maker function for, for for this i can call that from the radix ledger radix ledger fundamentally understands what the concept of a continuous function market maker is understands what the concept of a token is and i can combine these together to create a continuous function market maker for issuing futures for example and it's these building blocks these tools making these secure and easy to use that we think differentiates Radix, not just from delivering decentralized finance as it is today, but making it easy to innovate for what the future of decentralized finance is going to be. Thank you very much for listening. I hope this was interesting and helpful for you. If you would like to find out more about Radix, please go to our web website, radixdlt.com. If you would like to follow us on Twitter, you can find us at uh, radixdlt. If you want to follow me on Twitter, Twitter. I'm at Piers Ridyard. If you want to come and find out more about our community, you can come and find us on Telegram. And otherwise, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, smash the like button and leave comments in the in the video below if you would like me to do a series or an explainer about anything else in DeFi. Thank you very much for your time and goodbye.